We're in the book of Colossians. We've been talking about your identity in Christ. Boy, we need that in our culture today, don't we? We have people that don't have a clue who they are. They don't have a clue who God says they are. We have learned for the last few weeks that you are who God says you are. You're not who your failures say you are. You're not identified by the sin in your past. You're not even identified by the successes in your past. You know, that's pride. If I think that I am my accomplishments, I am what I am at work, I am what I've accumulated in the bank account, that's not who I am. I am who Jesus Christ says I am. And so many of us struggle with that, do we not? We, we struggle with our own value, our own worth. And understand something, your net worth has nothing to do with your personal worth. Your net worth has nothing to do with how valuable you are to God. And so we're learning who we are. We're learning that in Colossians, uh, God says that we're sons and daughters of Christ. We're identified by our relationship with Jesus Christ. Last week we looked about that we're stewards, and God has given us this stewardship. A steward is someone that doesn't own something, but they manage something that someone else owns. And that's your life as a believer. God has given you a life. He's given you talent. He's given you a family, and he expects us to manage those things as good stewards. And we saw even that we're to manage our suffering, those moments that God places in our life that we don't like, but God wants us to manage them for his glory. Well, today, I'm going to talk about another thought here from Colossians, and here's what I'm going to talk to you about today. You are a leader. Yes, you. That's the title of the message. You are a leader. Yes, you. And you got little notes there. If you'd like to take some notes, I would at least like somebody to pick it up so that I can think that maybe you're… All right, there we go. I want you to write on it. And you may be drawing a funny picture of me, but at least make me think that you're listening, okay? Uh, you know, some of you are barely out of junior high school. You have to draw funny-looking little figures, all right? But we're talking about leadership. You are called by God to be a leader. Now, you may not know it, but God has called you to lead. Every Christian must lead in their own sphere of influence. Now, some people are natural leaders, some people want to take charge and be in control, okay? Some people are natural leaders. Some people are uh, re hesitant leaders. They'll lead, but they don't want to. They, if it gets put on them, they'll do it. Some do not know that they are leaders, but they are. By the way, Moses was like this. In my opinion, Moses was probably the greatest leader other than Jesus Christ that we find in the Bible. Incredible leader. But I want you to notice something about what God did in the life of Moses. He took some time that he was preparing him. And his experiences in the first 40 years of his life being there in Pharaoh's palace. What an incredible story. And then he lost it. And there are some of the world's greatest leaders that when people look at them, they don't think they're very good leaders. Because once again, they're looking at it through the lens of humanity. They're looking at it through the lens of what we see. They're like, oh no, this person's not a leader. They failed. Moses, he murdered a man and he lost it all. And for 40 years, now think about this. What if you were in line to be maybe the next Pharaoh or maybe a king or maybe you're a part of the royal family? He had all this wealth and influence and money and fame. And then in one day, you lost it all. And instead of being in the palace, you're out. You didn't even have your own sheep, but you were a shepherd tending somebody else's sheep. And he said, well, you know, you, you need a self-motivational speech to get you going. And you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And Mo, uh, Moses did after 40 years. 
He was 80 years old when God really began to use him. God was preparing him. By the way, sometimes your experiences, the successes in your life, they're going to be used by God for you to influence others. But then sometimes he's going to use the failures in your life as well. In fact, the most authentic kind of leadership is that kind of leadership that says, I'm a servant leader, I'm going to lead, and I'm not going to put on airs, I'm not going to pretend, but I'm going to be who I am, who God has called me to be, and I'm going to lead. Now, you say, well, I'm not much of a leader. Well, you know, leadership is really about influence, and all of us have a sphere of influence. How many have a family? Raise your hand. You have family? Okay. How many have friends? Raise your hand. How many have neighbors? Maybe you don't like them, but you at least have neighbors, right? Maybe you live in an apartment complex and it's that noisy neighbor that you're just like, every time I'm trying to go to sleep, or the one that plays the music too loud, right? And, and you just, just about lose it. But we all have neighbors. How many have somebody that you work with? Raise your hand, all right? Well, here's the point. God's called you to be a leader. Now, you can be the most important leader as far as the world is concerned in the world and you still are called to be a leader in your sphere of influence. Just because you have a position doesn't make you a leader, okay? God has called you to lead. You have a family. He wants you to lead those children, your spouse, your parents, your family, your cousins, even that weird uncle, all right? We all have that, right? God wants you to lead. He wants you to lead in your work. He wants you to lead in your sphere of influence, in your school, in your neighborhood. Man, we've all probably had experience with a neighborhood association, right? Man, that can be, maybe that's the definition of hell. I'm not sure if you have one of those. Anybody ever have a bat? Don't raise your hand. They might the leader of your neighborhood association might be here, all right? But the truth is this. God has called us to lead. He's called us to take the opportunities that we have to influence others for Christ. And the interesting thing about this is that God, the more, the more you lead, the more faithful you are, that uh, you'll get more opportunity and more blessing. And that's what God wants for your life. Now, before I read today, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. But before I read, I want to point out one word that will help us understand what the Apostle Paul was writing. And it's the word struggle. The word struggle. Now, uh, in Greek, uh, which the New Testament was written in, this word is an athletic term. Okay, And Paul did this often in my, many of his writings. He would use athletic metaphors. He talked about running the race. He talked about boxing and beating the air like, you know, you're just wasting your time. And he, and he talked about finishing his course. And so he here was using this when he talked to the church. He said, I struggle for you. I struggle. And it was an athletic term that literally had to do with what an athlete did to be able to compete. Now understand, it's very important that you understand what Paul was thinking because in his day when he used these athletic metaphors, he wasn't thinking about the Georgia Bulldogs, all right? No, he was a godly man. He didn't think about them at all, all right? So uh, no reaction? No, okay. <laughs> No Georgia Bulldog fans in here, I guess, all right? So either that or you have your sleep. Just elbow the person next to you, all right? But here's the point. He was thinking about uh, the Olympic-style games that they had in his day. And this is, and I've told you this before, um, but what these athletes did in that day, this is a little weird, they competed naked, now, maybe that would get the TV ratings up. I'm not sure. But these athletes competed naked. You said, well, that was weird. Yeah, it was. But here's their thinking. And, and Paul used this to make a spiritual point. In Hebrews, it talks about lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and let us run with patience, with endurance, the race 
that is set before us. Once again, using this athletic term, what is he talking about there? Well, the reason they competed naked was they thought that they were laying aside, ridding themselves of the things that hindered them. And that's what God wants us to do. Lay aside the sin that hinders us. And by the way, sin always hinders. Sin always hinders. Uh, But it's not just sin. I believe that often the weights in our life can be good things that are not sin necessarily in and of themselves. Maybe it's something that wastes your time. Maybe it's something that dilutes your purpose in life. Maybe it's something that has just become dominant in your life when Jesus used to be dominant in your life. Maybe it's the center point, the focal point of your life when you need to change that. We need to lay aside the weight. Look, it can be something as, as simple as you not managing your time. You ever said, well, I don't have time for that. Isn't that a weird statement? We all have the exact same amount of time every single day. I don't get 28 hours a day and you get 18 hours a day. We all get 24 hours a day. That's the way time is. I don't have time for that. It's really just an admission that you're not managing your time or the things that you're choosing conflict maybe with what God wants for your life. So uh, what Paul was saying here was that I'm struggling. And, and here's what we know that athletes do. They commit. You cannot be an athlete without committing. They train. The amazing thing, we watch these athletic endeavors. And I love sports. I don't watch it like I used to, but I'm a big college sports fan, basketball, football, like, like the Atlanta Braves. People ask me if I'm a uh, baseball fan. I say, no, I'm a Braves fan. All right. Now, I don't mean by that that the Braves are not a good baseball team, but I don't really pay attention to all the other ones. I just see what the Braves are doing. And, um, but we know that an athlete commits and they train. If you're going to be a leader, you got to make a commitment. You got to commit to train, and then they focus on the goal. And that's what God has called us to do. So, uh, kind of a long introduction, but let me read to you the scripture that shows us how we as believers are called to lead. You're a leader. Yes, you. And this is who God has called you to be. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes, he said, for I want you to know how great a struggle, that's that athletic word, I have for you and for those at Laodicea. That was a city about 15 miles from where uh, Colossae was, which is the reason it's called the letter of Colossians or the book of Colossians. It's to the Colossian church. He says, I have a struggle for you, those of you at Colossae, and the people of Laodicea, for all who have not seen me face to face. He was kind of casting a broad net here, right? He's saying, the people in my local church, the people in the community, the, the ones down the road a little bit, and everybody that doesn't even get a chance to meet me. He's a team builder. He said that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a second. Uh, You can get tricked by things that sound plausible. But he said, don't fall for that nonsense. He said, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Now, I want to give you just a few things that leaders do. God's called you to lead. He's called you to be a leader. He's called you to be a leader in the church. He's called you to be a leader in your home, in your family, in your school, Um, in your neighborhood, at your work. He has called each of us to lead in our sphere of influence. Let's look at what good leaders do. First of all, leaders participate. 
They participate. We have that statement around here that we say a lot, uh, that participation is church membership. Participation is membership. You want to be a member? Participate. Get involved. And I've told you this before, but the first church I pastored, we had 3,362 members. I don't know why I know that number. I just remembered it. Um, and at the time that I became the pastor that, we had 3,362 members, and we had about 200 people that showed up every Sunday. Now, the FBI couldn't find probably half of the members of our church. And I began to think about that. Are they really members just because they signed up on a piece of paper? Let, let me give you a good illustration. I'm a member of Facebook. How many have Facebook? How many are under 20 and have Facebook? Oh, a couple. All right, so good. Uh, not many, though. Uh, here's the point. I'm a member of Facebook, but I don't participate. You say, well, we see some posts that you put up. I don't put them up. Somebody else puts them up for me, all right? And uh, if you send me, a, in fact, I've unfortunately done this. There have been people that have sent me message, a message on Facebook, and I didn't find out about it until like three months later. And they're like, why didn't you respond to what I said? I said, I had no idea. What are you talking about? Well, I sent you a message on Facebook. And I'm like, yeah, that's your problem, all right? Now, the point is, am I a member of Facebook? Yes. Do I participate in Facebook? No. And the point is, participation is membership. Now, my wife, on the other hand, I don't think there's a day that goes by that she's not on Facebook. In fact, there may not be an hour that goes by that she is not on Facebook or checking a message of some kind, all right? Now, she participates, and she tells me all about all these people and all that they're going through and all this stuff and showing me all these pictures, and oh, it exhausts me. But let me just tell you what leaders do. They participate. They participate. I want to challenge those of you that watch online uh, if you're going to be a leader, you got to participate in the church. That's what God has called us to do. Uh, it is important. Number two, leaders build. Paul talked about the people in the church at Colossae and those in Laodicea, those that have not seen him personally. And what does that tell us about Paul? He was a team builder. He built the team. He was a good team member. He made sure those around him knew thou, that they were very important. He built. God has called us to build. He's called us to build the church. He's called us to reach people. He's called us to be a part of a team. Good leaders build. Number three, leaders encourage. Now, some people are better at this than others. He said that their hearts may be encouraged. Now, this word here, encourage, is an interesting word. It means to call someone to your side. Do you ever do that as a parent? You just had a, a kid that maybe stubbed their toe or did something that hurt, and they, the mom, well, she's good at that. Come here, baby, and she just calls them right to their side. That's what that word means. It means that we're to encourage one another. Now, my mother is a great encourager. My dad... You know, I love him very much, respect him a lot, but he was not a great encourager. Um, there would be times that no matter what I did, he would point out what I could have done better. Anybody ever had somebody like that in your life? My mother, on the other hand, she was the world's greatest encourager. Now, moms tend to be encouragers, okay? Heard about two moms that were bragging about their sons, and, and one mom said, my son can count to 10, and he knows his ABCs. The other woman looks and says, well, he should. He's 18 years old. <laughs> Moms, they, they brag on their kids, right? They are an encourager. My mom was an encourager. Um, many years ago when I was in high school, I played sports. Uh, and one of the sports I played was uh, I, I ran track. I know I don't look like it, but I did back then. And... Um, I forget my sophomore or junior, I think it was my sophomore year of high school, 
uh, I was in the state finals, made it all the way to the state finals, and it was in the mile run. And we had a you know, pretty good number of people there watching. We were in a stadium there in Boone, North Carolina, in the mountains. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And I was in the state championship race for the mile run. And uh, so if you know anything about track, you know that's four laps uh, around a quarter mile track. And so they fired the gun, we took off, and man, we were running, running, huffing and puffing. And, and I came around on the last lap, and I was way ahead. In fact, it was like, unless I had like a, a blowout, I was going to win the race, it looked like, okay? So I, I came around the back. Uh, run the back stretch, and I'm in the lead. Came around the last turn. I'm talking about I'm 110 yards away from the finish line, and I'm like in the lead. And in fact, they're so far back that it was obvious, unless I tripped and fell or broke an ankle, I was going to win the race. And all of a sudden, I could hear my mother. Now she was in a big crowd. I thought. She was in this gigantic crowd, and I could hear her voice above all everyone else. And she was like, go, Richie, go, go, Richie, go. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool and embarrassing, you know, my mother. And I was like, man, she sure does sound close. And I was kind of out of the corner of my eye trying to see her in the stands, and then all of a sudden I saw something move on the inside of the track. And I do not know how it happened, but my mother was on the inside, the infield of the track, and she was running stride for stride with me. Now, I was getting ready to win the state championship, and my little old mama was about to outrun me to the finish line. It was embarrassing, okay? And, and I, you know, literally all of the thoughts of winning the championship left my mind. I'm like, oh my God, I better beat my mom to the finish line or I'm never going to live it down. Now, maybe you've got somebody like that in your life. They go to extremes to encourage you. But you know, that's what the Bible says that we're to do as leaders. Now, let, let me just say something. It's easy to get discouraged. And have you ever noticed that discouragement likes company? Well, I guess everything's going to be bad because I'm having a bad day. And what happens is we, we see something happen that we don't like and it like discourages us and then we discourage everybody else around us. And here's what God says, don't do that. Be an encourager. Find the good. You say, well, that's just not being authentic. That's not being the real me. You know what that's being? That's being a person of faith. And let me tell you, and I believe this, faith trumps facts. Now, here's the thing about faith. God doesn't require you to have faith to stick your head in the sand. He's not saying deny reality. If you've been told by the doctor that you have cancer, there's no point in you try to go pretend that you don't have cancer. But you know what you can do? You can have faith in God that no matter what happens, he's got it and everything's going to be in control. You see, faith trumps facts because we know who is in control. Leaders encourage. Well, let, let me give you these other things quickly. Leaders unify. They unify the body. Uh, he says being knit together. Romans 12, 4 and 5, just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it. And it takes every one of us to make it complete. Listen, not, not to that. I don't know. How, that was perfect timing, wasn't it? He says it takes every one of us. You know who's important to the team? You are. You know who God wants to be faithful? You. You know who this church needs? It needs you. Every one of us is important. That's what the Bible says. And so we shouldn't give up. He says, for we each have different work to do. Now, we'd all be in trouble if everybody just had my talent. Now, God's given me some talent, and, uh, but it, it really is very narrow, okay? 
I know people think, oh man, you, you got talent. Well, not that much, to be honest. There's one or two things I can do pretty well. Uh, but God's called you. There are a lot of people that have a whole lot more talent than I do. Thank God. And God's called you. Maybe your talent is different than mine. And I'm glad God hasn't called every one of you to pastor the church because then I wouldn't be able to be the pastor of this church, right? So, but he's called all of us. Some have the talent to sing and some have the talent uh, with uh, electronic stuff and, and equipment and uh, computers and uh, with kids. And I could just go on and on. And the more I talk, the more stupid I sound because I don't know what to call some of this stuff, right? So, but here's the point. God said, not me, not me. This is the word of God. We need every one of you. That's what he said. We need you. Don't think you're not important. You are. It's important that you show up. What if when the Falcons play this fall, um, and for those of you that don't know much about sports, you got 11 guys that play at one time, 11 on offense, 11 on defense, okay? What if... Uh, The Falcons had their left tackle. Just didn't show up. He stayed on the sideline. Nobody was in there, and they had 10. A wide open gap. Well, you know what's going to happen? The quarterback's going to get killed. You say, what all does that mean? It means that's not very good if you're not a sports fan, okay? And here's the point, and don't miss this. If you're not there, if you don't show up, the team suffers, And this is what God has called all of us to do. Leaders unify. Then leaders love. He said, being knit together in love. Now, I don't have to remind you of this, but uh, love in the Bible is not so much about emotion as it is about action and decisions. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean that emotion is not attached to love. Read the book of Song of Solomon. Um, the Bible says that love is more powerful than death. That's powerful. So there's powerful emotions involved with love. But listen, you read in the New Testament the kind of love that the Bible talks about. You know what? It's action. It's not just emotion. And this is what it tells me. I can exhibit loving action whether I like you or not. I can, through the Spirit of Christ, exhibit loving action and use kind words, even if you've offended me. I can show loving actions whether I feel the warm fuzzies around you or not. That's what he's talking about. Leaders love. And then leaders teach. Leaders teach. That doesn't mean that uh, everybody has to have a platform. But he's talking about uh, teaching with your life. In fact, some of the most effective teaching, you read in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it talks about how that uh, we are to lead with our life. We are to lead by example. The Bible talks about when you go outside and when you come inside, when you walk on the way, when you go on a trip, and I'm paraphrasing, but he's basically saying when you're hanging out at the house and when you're going on a picnic or you're going on vacation or when you're going to work or when your kids come home from school, is what he's saying, that we teach with our lives. Everyone has a story and everyone has an experience. God wants you to use that for him. Some of you haven't figured out how God can use your story yet. But I love it when it dawns on you how God can use your story. My dad, many of you know uh, that he was an alcoholic. And my dad was far from God. We'd never been to church together as a family until I was a little boy. And my mom was a Christian and she really began to pray for my dad. We went to church together and my dad got saved. And um, man, he didn't know how God was going to use his story. He was just an old tobacco farmer from North Carolina, an old redneck. He uh, was a drunk. How was God going to use his story? But fast forward, my dad is now 78 years old. He's pastored three churches. 
He was a missionary for a few years in Mexico. He's pastored in Arizona. He's pastored in North Carolina. God has used him literally to teach all over the world. And you know what God did? He took just an old country boy. He took an old redneck that was an alcoholic that was so shy, he could not, literally could not get up in front of people unless he had a drink. And I don't know how that worked out being a pastor. Maybe he drank every time before he got up. I don't know. But uh, I do know this. God used him, and he used his story. He'll use you. You have a story. He said, well, mine's not very dramatic. Well, thank God. Let that be an example to the kids in your life. Hey, kids, uh, I, didn't, I didn't crash into the wall because I made the right choices. That's your story. Use it. Leaders teach. Leaders protect. He said, that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. I love how he worded that. Sometimes the best sounding things are the, <laughs> are the most filled with lies. Don't be deluded by plausible arguments. And do not look at life through the natural. The Bible says we walk by faith not by sight. I imagine when Moses and the children of Israel were facing the Red Sea, they had been delivered from Egyptian slavery. They were on the way. There was a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other, Pharaoh's army behind them. They thought they were going to die. We walk by faith, not by sight. It looked bad. Once again, no point in denying reality. They were in a tough spot. But aren't you glad that God is able to part the sea so you can walk across on dry ground? That's what God is able to do. Leaders protect. Make sure you guard that. And then finally, leaders trust. He talked about the firmness of your faith. Leaders trust God. Leaders trust God when it seems bleak. Leaders trust God when it seems like that there's no hope. Leaders trust God when it seems like that there's no good answer. So I want to challenge you today. Who, who does God say you are? We, he says you're his in Christ. We've already talked about that. He says we're to be a steward of the things that he puts in our hand. And he says we're, we're a leader. And God's called you to lead. He's called me to lead. And I hope and pray that each of us will lead well. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. I pray that you'd help all of us to lead in our sphere. We don't have to have a position. We don't even have to have a platform. But God, you've given us a place to lead with our homes and families and friends and in the church. So God, help us to step up. Help us to do that. Lord, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would just knit this word into hearts. And Lord, uh, Jesus, as you said, I pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers and leaders into the harvest. God, help us all to take that seriously. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.